Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cyanobacteria What You Need to Know webinar. This is Amy Smagula, and I am going to be serving as moderator for the webinar. Uh, this is a two-part webinar offered by the New England chapter of the North American Lake Management Society. The uh, webinar is going to be taking place over the next hour and a half. And uh, we are hosted by the New England chapter of the North American Lake Management Society. This is a group that is an affiliate of the North American Lake Management Society. And as our name implies, we are comprised of members from the different New England states. Our membership includes lake and watershed residents and association members, professionals in various fields of lake and watershed management, members from academia, students, agency personnel, and many others. We have been offering webinars in lieu of in-person annual meetings for a year now, and it seems to be well received. So we plan to keep that up and we welcome uh, input from you about what topics you would like to hear about, and we will follow up with those in the near future. To learn more about the New England chapter of NOMS, you can visit us online, or you can also learn more about the North American Lake Management Society, our parent organization, by visiting that website as well. Uh, we do encourage you to support NECNOMS. Uh, our membership dues are only $10 a year, and our membership year is July 1st to June 30th. Uh, we do uh, benefit from member support that allows us to include more programming and more resources to our membership. You can join NECNOMS by uh, going online to our website, or you can simply mail a check payable to NECNOMS to our NECNOMS chair in Rhode Island. Her contact information is on the NECNOMS website. So as I mentioned, this is a two-part webinar. The uh, first one is going to happen momentarily with our speakers lined up. Part two is going to take place in May, so about a month from now on May 25th. That's also going to be from 10.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. And that is going to also be in the same platform like we have today. The May topic is going to be on cyanobacteria monitoring and control. So about today's webinar, it's going to be two roughly 30-minute presentations with a block of 30 minutes at the end for questions and discussion with the presenters. During the webinar, all presenters or all attendees are going to be muted, but you do have the option of typing questions into the dialog box. And then after both presenters have given their talks, I will moderate those questions for them and we can have uh, them answer those questions towards the end of the webinar. The webinar is being recorded so that you can view it again or you can share it with others who were interested but not able to attend today. Uh, so today's topics and presenters, uh, the first presentation is going to be given by Dr. Barry Rosen with the Florida Gulf Coast University. Dr. Rosen is going to be giving a talk on cyanobacteria biology and toxin formation. Our second presentation is going to be by Dr. Elizabeth Hilborn, and she is with EPA, and she's going to be talking about cyanobacteria toxin impacts on people, pets, and wildlife. And just some information on each of our presenters. Dr. Barry Rosen began studying algae at the University of Connecticut as an undergraduate at 19 years old, and he continued on for his master's and his PhD from the same university. Uh, Dr. Rosen specializes in the identification and characterization of cyanobacteria, and he works on isolating and culturing cyanobacteria as many of the overlooked species are potential toxin producers. He works with organisms from across the United States, and that also does include taste and odor producing taxa as well. He is currently a professor in the School of Water at Florida Gulf Coast University. Uh, and then our second presenter is Dr. Elizabeth Hillborn and a little bit about her. She is a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she earned a BS in biology and she earned her doctorate in veterinary medicine at North Carolina State University. 
She is a board, she is board certified in the American College of Veterinary Preventative Medicine. She completed her Master of Public Health at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and served as a fellow in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Epidemic Intelligence Service. She works as an environmental health scientist and epidemiologist in the Office of Research and Development, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Center for Public Health and Environmental Assessment. Dr. Hilborn's work includes the characterization of public health impacts of waterborne disease, emerging infections, and contaminants such as toxic cyanobacteria. So without further ado, we are going to transition to Dr. Rosen's presentation, and I'm gonna turn control over to him. Dr. Rosen. Thank you, Amy. And I'm so glad everyone's here to listen to me ramble on about cyanobacteria and their biology. Uh, just one small correction. My master's was in Minnesota and PhD was in Bowling Green, Ohio with uh, Rex Lau. I guess I didn't put that in the record. You kind of forget this so long ago. Anyways, I am going to talk about cyanobacteria because it's one of my favorite topics. And the first thing I like to do is explain where they fit in amongst all the other algae that you might know about. Um, when I learned about these, we called them blue-green algae because all the algae are unified because they have chlorophyll A. And cyanobacteria are no exception. They have the same kind of chlorophyll that all the other ones in this tree that are colored have the chlorophyll A. But then there's a bunch of other pigments we can look at, um, cell walls, the motility, the, the nature of the cell wall. Diatoms have silica cell walls as an example. Um, so morphology becomes important, storage compounds, and a host of other things. So again, cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae, all have chlorophyll A. There's that molecule in the upper right-hand corner. And that often gives them that, that greenish color that we see. But um, and those pigments, by the way, these are prokaryotic organisms. So that means there's no chloroplast, no nucleus, and no membrane-bound organelles. They do have membranes, so they have thylakoids, and that's what that arrow is pointing to. So the pigments needed for photosynthesis and light capture and splitting of water, making oxygen, all occur in those thylakoids. And they have DNA and ribosomes, but they are truly prokaryotic cells and they divide by simply pinching in half. There's no sexual reproduction in the cyanobacteria. And if you look closely at that cell wall, it's just like you learned in microbiology, that gram-negative stain. These are gram-negative bacteria, first and foremost. And you can look at that layering in the cell wall to tell you that it's a gram-negative organism. They have a lot of interesting features that they use to make them so successful. They've been around at least 3.5 billion years as an organism, maybe even longer. So I always try to organize what's a priority for them. What do they need to do first to be most successful? And I think number one is they have to capture energy from the sun and form ATP and NADPH, two of the energy bearing molecules inside the cells. And secondarily, they split water, but it's a waste product for the cyanobacteria. They don't need that oxygen. And eventually that carbon dioxide, when they, they split it and, and fix it into sugars, and again, I'm using sugars in the broadest term here, because all the algae can make some kind of sugar. So that metabolism and churning that sunlight into that thick sugar is very important. So there's a specialized structure inside of cyanobacteria. And the arrow on the right is pointing to that structure. It's called a carboxysome. And they always have this um, hexagonal sort of shape to them. And inside of it are thousands and thousands of copies of Rubisco, ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase. And that's the enzyme required for fixing um, carbon and turning it into the sugars. So besides having that structure and all that mechanism ready to capture that sunlight and, and capture that CO2, they have to capture the sunlight itself. So they have something called a phycobilosome, which has a fair amount of pigments that you may or may not have heard of. One is phycocyanin, and that's what gives cyanobacteria that blue, bluish color plus the green. 
they can also have phycourethrin, which is a reddish color. And the mixture of the reddish and the bluish give you a whole variety of colors. They can be grass green, they can be bright green, they can be brown, they can be black. And the idea behind this array of pigments is to capture various wavelengths and be more successful at depth in a water column or in a mat. And they eventually all have to pass that energy that they capture onto chlorophyll A. That's, that's an important feature. And if you look at a colony on the far left, you see how I've lit, lit up some of these cells with um, epifluorescent microscopy. Even in one colony, you have variations in pigment. That's just the way it is. They are really efficient at capturing light and they will capture anything they, they can get their uh, little antennae on. And you can see some filamentous cyanobacteria up above that are slightly different colored. So it's really quite cool. They're, they're taking advantage of everything that's out there. The next feature is buoyancy. And buoyancy with cyanobacteria, and actually other bacteria can do this too, they can regulate their position in the water column if you have this structure called the gas vesicle. And it's not a vacuole because it's not membrane bound. It's a series of these long proteins. And you can see in this TEM that I took that sometimes you can cut across those long hexagonal shaped prote proteinaceous um, structures and you can see them in longitudinal or cross section and they fill up with air and it causes the organisms to float up perfect i mean you get to the right place in the water column for maximizing and optimizing photosynthesis but then something happens as you're photosynthesizing and you're taking those sugars and making them into complex molecules the c6h1206 it's technically ballast it actually collapses this gas vesicle and those heavy laden with sugar cyanobacterial filaments will sink down in the water column. And when they sink down in the water column, they get out of the photic zone, they stop making so much ballast or make none at all. Um, they still metabolize, they still are cleaving those sugar molecules off of that bigger um, polysaccharide that they've made. And when they do that, they're basically chewing up the ballast, refilling and reinflating the gas vesicles, and then they're able to come back up again. And they'll do this on a diurnal basis. They'll go up and down. Um, and when they're at the bottom of that you know, range of diurnal movement, closer to the bottom sediments, closer to the thermocline, what a perfect time to pick up nutrients that are being released, especially phosphorus. So it's a really a dual purpose. They are, they're bobbing up and down to maximize sunlight. They pick up a load of nutrients. And this can go on and on. But keep in mind, only selected genera have the gas vesicle. And keep in mind that if a nutrient runs out, something becomes limiting, they will lose their ability and get stuck at the top of the water column or stuck at the bottom. So it's, it's not perfect. It has, everything kind of has to be in balance for that to happen. And that buoyancy leads to some issues that you all might have to deal with. And first, if my little diagram here, it's a schematic. If you have 100,000 cells per liter, and that initial distribution all in that photic zone, that buoyancy means you could have um, 10 million cells per liter with their toxin levels. The wind can then blow them up on one shore and you can have 100 million or more cells per liter. So it makes a big difference, especially for drinking water plants. If you're a drinking water plant like this one in Lake Mead, and you have different intakes, you can avoid that population. So as the organisms increase in the surface, you might be able to use lower and lower intakes unless drought has dried out your water source. So it has implications for anyone that can move and change their water source. If you can't, then it becomes an issue. And some of the water drinking facilities in Lake Champlain can move, others cannot. So they have other strategies for staying in the water column. Again, this is, um, I'm talking about the strategies that make cyanobacteria so successful. And what I call the morphology of the cells, the morphology, morphology of the filaments, the morphology of bundles of cells. So the top picture is a phanosominum floss aqua. Uh, close up and you can see it's bundles of filaments. And the reason it looks so grainy is because it also has a fair amount of those gas vesicles. And between the bundles of cells, so that maybe one end gets picked up a little by a little microcurrent, 
and the other one, other end isn't, and it pulls that whole bundle up. But between that and all their gas vesicles, it's a very successful, often floating on the surface. Another one is this Dilocospermum, the next picture down, and it's a spiral. But again, if it's falling through the water, it's going to slow down as if it's a straight sink to the bottom organism. If you've got this coil, you might slow down your sinking. That's that's important, again, staying in the water column, unless you're the bottom organism. This is formerly known as Cylindrospermopsis. It's now Raphidiopsis. Genetics has proven it's Raphidiopsis. And it's a mid-water column bloomer. And it doesn't really form those big surface thick blooms that we see, but it prefers that mid-water column. Um, and it, it is lightly pigmented relative to some of the others. Uh, but it can have gas vesicles, it can float up. And I like this picture. This is Gliotrichia, and this one has all these filaments with the bases of them tucked in together, and I call this a pincushion. Actually, this organism was boiled for 15 minutes, and chlorophyll is um, the greenish orange, I mean, the, the orangish uh, yellow color. The green is actually cells that are dead and it's, it's lit up with a DNA stain. But it just goes to show you that these colonies are not only uh, designed to stay up in the water column, but they're also keeps the integrity of these colonies together. And that's a whole other strategy. One of the really interesting features about cyanobacteria is their ability, again, if they have um, a specialized cell, it used to be called a heterocyst. It's now called a heterocyte. It's a specialized cell that is, contains the 60 enzymes needed to capture N2 from the atmosphere or the N2 that's dissolved in the water and turn that fixed nitrogen into ammonia and then into amino acids that it passes on to the adjacent cells. And so to do this, that, that enzyme complex in there, the whole nitrogenase complex, it's inhibited by oxygen. So again, this is a you know a relatively simple. This is a cyanobacteria. This is a, a prokaryotic organism. But this is the modifications that they've gone through to be able to do this really ex energy expensive but critically important ability to fix nitrogen. So the first thing they want to do is exclude oxygen from diffusing in from the water. So they put an extra lipid layer around the cells here, and you can see this thickening around the outside of this cell. Here's a heterocyte over here. And then the, the little microplasma desmata in here are what allow it to be passed, the fixed um, amino acids to the adjacent cell. And down here on the bottom left, courtesy of Hans Perl, you can see one of these heterocytes. It looks different than the adjacent cells. And actually look at, you see some bacteria attached here because they, they like that extra nitrogen that leaks a little bit out of there. So then, okay, you've done that. You shut down and keep oxygen from seeping in from the outside. But these are cells, vegetative cells, that differentiate from uh, and form that heterocyte. And so when they differentiate and they form that extra layer around the outside, they also have to break down photosynthesis into the two parts that exist. You've got photosystem one, which is the light capture, again, making the NADP an ATP integral part and needed for the enzymatic activity of the nitrogenase. But you don't want the oxygen evolution that comes from photosystem two. So they break down photosystem two inside those cells. And so you can see the thylakoids look different. They aren't a, a aligned like the other cells. And actually with the light microscope, you can see here's a heterocyte. It's that yellowish color cell here and this filament amongst the bright green cells. So it's visible to see. So there, the, there they do. They have added a layer. They've knocked out photosystem two, and they are busy fixing nitrogen. And we know that they'll fix more nitrogen when it's not available. So if the environment goes nitrogen limiting, the nitrogen fixing organisms will have an advantage. Now I showed you this in the heterocyte, but know that there's a limited number of examples that. The uh, nitrogen fixation also can occur with certain organisms that don't have a heterocyte, 
at nighttime. Some of the single single cellular ones can do it even. They can have the nitrogenase complex, maybe not as sophisticated as here, but they're doing other processes to, to capture some nitrogen. It's much less extensive than the heterocyte-bearing the heterocyte organisms. So here's a few pictures that you might see under the microscope. There's a heterocyte across the top here. It's probably a Dilophospermum. Um, on the left is a, a Cuspidothrix, and then here's a Raphidiopsis. And then here's another Dilophospermum uh, circinale here curled up, and you can see all the heterocytes. And on the left, I'll show you a microcystis, and I put a big rec red X through it because it does not fix nitrogen. Just keep that in mind. However, to have ample microcystin production and accumulation in the cell, besides having the genes, you have to have a fair amount of nitrogen available because it's a, a compound that's, uh, it's an element that's heavy in microcystin itself. So again, these are simple organisms. They divide. So here's the cell wall. Again, they have a cell wall like, like plants do in many senses, but they're pinching in. So one cell divides, it, it simply pinches in, and that's how we get one cell and turn it into two. But cyanobacteria are also thermophiles. Again, as bacteria, they can take advantage of warmer waters. That's why we often see them in the summertime because they do so well, although right now, Oregon is just, I know, ice out's been a little while, but we have a bloom of cyanobacteria out there. And Amy was just talking about ice out up in New England just happened. And yeah, it happens early, early, and it doesn't matter so much temperature, but they can grow faster as it gets warmer. And we talk about growth rate as doublings per day. Divisions per, per day is another way of saying it. So if you have three divisions in a day, and that's possible when these things are warm and really blooming, you can have one cell at 8 a.m., two cells, four cells, eight cells. Those are That's three divisions, and you end up with 16 cells by the end of the day. And if you think about controlling these populations, you have a, a huge task in front of you if you go after actively growing bloom, bloom. Can you have enough contact time with whatever your toxicant is to kill that bloom to to kill them all. If not outside of what I call the kill zone, you really knock them all out. Now, this kind of rapid growth can only happen if there's no limiting factors. Light's not limiting, nutrients are not limiting, uh, mixing isn't keeping them out of the photic zone, all these things. So rapid growth might only be for a certain period of time in the middle of a bloom. It's, it's okay, but some of these things have to be taken into consideration when you sample, where you sample, and all that needs to be thought about. More mechanisms. And of course, I'm just talking about the mechanisms we know of as you know human beings looking in on these organisms. There's a lot more that we probably do not know about. So another mechanism they have is they, they need to bring in that carbon dioxide and there's at least five different enzymatic systems for bringing in that carbon dioxide. And they bring it in so that it's sometimes a thousand fold over the external, external to the cell. That thousand fold increase of CO2 or its products inside the cell is very important. Why? Because Rubisco's in there trying to grab the various forms of carbon dioxide. It gets, um, it, it sometimes gets fooled, as we say, by oxygen. So if you increase the thousand fold over the ambient um, CO2 in the water, you're making the Rubisco much more efficient because you're providing a higher concentration of CO2. It's not gonna be confused as easily. So those transport systems, some of which require ATP, but it gives, again, another great advantage to the cyanobacteria. So if that's not enough, what if they run across an abundance of a nutrient? And one of them that's very important, of course, is phosphorus. And if phosphorus is in abundance, cyanobacteria will do what's called luxuriant nutrient uptake. And they'll make a polyphosphate body. Again, this is not unique to cyanobacteria. Bacteria can also do this. And here's a picture of a polyphosphate body, kind of indistinct, looks different than that carboxysome. They'll store enough phosphorus for up to 10 additional generations when phosphorus becomes limiting. 
Um, and when they bring in that phosphorus, oftentimes they're sequestering other things like sodium and magnesium and some of the other metals. So when they cleave off the phosphorus molecules one at a time, they're also cleaving off a lot of these trace metals, some of which they need uh, for, for growth, for photosynthesis and other, other metabolic processes. They have some other weird adaptations that um, allow them to be successful. That I like to talk about as the mucilage, the slime. And I'm, I'm lighting it up a couple of different ways. This is uh, on the left is Microcystis wessenbergii, and you can see the cells and they have the very thick mucilage around it. Um, there's other bundles of, of cells. Again, this kind of mucilage is probably there to help the organisms from being grazed upon by zooplankton. So here's a little daphnid down here on the right, and it encounters all that mucilage, they don't know there's something good and delicious inside, they may skip that particular organism. Or a bundle, they might graze the outside, but they're not going to get to all the filaments on the inside. And I've seen that in Cleotrichia, where it's grazed, all the outer filaments are grazed off, but the inside is still protected. Sometimes the mucilage gets really uh, thick, and this is a, a microcystis aeruginosa. I stained it with alcyon blue, and I'm finding that it's uh, produced in response to stress. Um, I did a study on salinity and increases in salinity as if these organisms are washing down a river into an estuary, they will produce mucilage for, for quite a while. I'm also finding that exposure to glyphosate, they produce this mucilage. So I think it's a general re response to stress, and but it also exhausts the cells. You know, if you're putting all that mucilage out, you know, it's a carbohydrate, so it's it's not beneficial. Maybe it is in the short term, but if you do it for too long, you're going to burn yourself burn yourself out as an organism. So the question is, how do we get a bloom? So here's a, a depiction of organisms. If you grab a liter of water, you're going to have six thousand different organisms in it. How do we know when or something is going to become the dominant organism and, and become a bloom? So you add a limiting factor, you don't necessarily know what it is, or it could be combinations of things. And you have a before and after, and the thing that was rare to become dominant, um, just so you know, a lot of the water bodies I look at, even in the wintertime, the organisms that might bloom in the summer are there, but they're there in low density. So they're there waiting for the opportunity. And I guess that's my point. They're sitting there as a quiescent stage, you know, subsistence, I find it in paraffinate, and I find it in lots of different systems. Something triggers that we don't know enough about. As, as a human being, we don't know enough about what all those triggers are because they're optimized for all these different things at, all the time. They're optimizing daily, weekly, monthly, there's seasonal forcing functions, there's temperature, there's light quality, there's rainfall. There's other organisms around them, the heterotrophs, the bacteria, what do they do? And they reach some threshold where they start to grow and then dominate. And they have some of these other strategies I just talked about to become the dominant organism. And a lot of stuff we just can't see. You know, I'm a traditional morphologist, but I'm, I'm caught up in some deep metagenomic studies on Lake Okeechobee. And you see the two uh, pico cyanobacteria that I'm talking about, the picoplankton here. No one even know the, knew that these were in there and they're dominant all the time. In Lake Okeechobee, a Sinecococcus um, uh, synovium, and that's genetics telling us that they're there, but we never really even observed them under the microscope. And not only that, this the year that this came from with my colleague down at Nova Southeastern, it kind of was a year there wasn't much of a typical microcystis bloom. So we're exploring, was there competition? Did they suck out the nutrients? What did they do? Um, and what's so special about these picocyanobacteria? They're, they're, they seem ecologically primitive, but they've lost a lot of uh, pathways that they no longer need and makes them very successful. Very briefly, a strategy is the toxins, the cyanotoxins, but not necessarily as a toxin themselves. There's, there's a lot of different um, reasons they make toxins. They're photoprotective. They store nitrogen. Um, 
they evolved before eukaryotic life did for the most part. So they're not after us. But if you have to put a human perspective on it, know that we have looked at it and saxitoxin is the most potent of all the, the uh, cyanotoxins out there. Freshwater cyanobacteria make it. Racine is the only more natural toxin. And saxitoxin is more potent than cobra toxin. But as Ken pointed out to me, he said, well, it's a matter of dose. You know, if you aren't drinking the water, and I'm going to let Elizabeth talk about how you're exposed, you know, it's, it's, that's a question. The exposure route is very, very important. And I'm working on inhalation effects to see if we can find something with that. So anyways, this is just a good comparison of, of some of the toxins that are out there, including strychnine and curare. Look at that. The cyanotoxins have those feet. And they're, again, very simply, this is all I'm going to touch on with this. As far as the families of toxins, you know, you have the hepatotoxins, which are livers, the microcystins. If you want to get a PhD in, in organic chemistry, you can find a new microcystin. We have 250 variants. About 85% have that um, ADA group, which helps a lot if you're doing ELISA. Doesn't help at all if you're doing LCMSMS, which we only have about 12 standards for. Um, anyway, so neurotoxins, we have anatoxin A. Anatoxin AS has been renamed to a guanotoxin, more to reflect the actual structure of it, the saxotoxin, and then the skin toxins. And I list BMAA here, even though I've never found it, and I've looked at over 60 samples so far. Um, it's a methodology thing, but we still have to talk about it. So when you look at a sample, this is taken with my iPhone. You've got gliotrichia on the left and microcystis on the right. You can see them. You can identify them even by, you know, because it's pretty obvious. But it's not obvious who's making toxin. And I, I took this slide from Greg Boyer. And there's no way of knowing just by knowing what species is in there even who's making toxin. And this is, again, a theoretical picture. Yes, no, yes, no. Keep in mind also, this is a bunch of keep in minds, that when a bloom dies off, you see that turquoise in the water, that, that phycocyanin leaking from the cells. It's not paint. It's the phycocyanin that's, that's leaking out of cells. And they pretty much don't want to lose that compound. They're not going to leak it at, at, you know, all the time. And that intracellular toxin is in the same position. It does not want to come out of the cells. But when a cell dies or is disrupted one way or another, that's when the toxin comes out, and that's when um, the phycocyanin comes out. So what is in the cells? How much is leaked? How much is leaked to the water? You get total toxin per liter. If you extract the entire water sample, you know, the freeze-saw technique, you can get all of it out of there, and that's the total toxin. But, you know, I want to know what's inside the cells. I think that's really important. So you can do that freeze-thaw. Sonication works to some extent. Bead, bead, uh, bead, Feeding also works. With sonication, we found that sometimes if you over sonicate, you actually can start to break down the toxins. So you have to find the sweet spot for that. On um, bead beating, if you don't know what that is, there's some handheld bead beaters and you can rupture cells. That's what we do for DNA extraction. And the other thing I'd like to point out is that even though under a regular light microscope, oh, you say, oh, nice, healthy looking microcystis colony. But look at the cells that are blue here. This is lit up with um, ultraviolet light. So the red cells, yes, they're nice and healthy. There's a lot of chlorophyll in them. But look at the clusters of blue cells scattered throughout. The bottom line is some cells are always dying in a population. And you have to know that you find low levels of concentration of toxin because you have those cells that are dying in a population. It's not, um, engineers hate this because they want to measure those little round circles and say how much toxin is coming out. But it's, it's unless you freeze the whole thing, you're not going to really know. Um, and even if you calculate it per cell, again, are you going to subtract out the dead cells? How, how are you really going to get that? But you can come close. And then this is a graphical abstract. I love it from, um, and microcystins are just the tip of the iceberg. There's all sorts of other cyanopeptides. Not all of them are toxic. Some of them are actually stimulatory. The only thing wrong with this um, particular graphical abstract is they show a chloroplast inside a cyanobacteria, which we know they don't have, because there's granum in there, and we know that. So there's the anabina peptids. So we're just beginning to look at it, and it, it's pretty cool. And I'm actually teaching a course 
I'm calling it What Lies Beneath. Again, we're doing a lot more work on, on genes. We know what the genes look like for all of these toxins. Pretty cool. And it's not so hard to work up techniques to analyze these genes. It's, it's, um, it's actually cheaper than doing an ELISA test. And again, not all species are the same. This is not Microcystis aeruginosa. It may look like it at first glance, but it's not. It's, it's Microcystis um, novechiae. And lastly, remember, lifeguards not on duty, the, the bacteriologists and microbiologists, and if you're like Ken Wagner and myself, the phycologists are not on duty. And with that, I say thank you and send me live samples. That's what I do for fun is look at live samples. Uh, thank you very much and, and we'll let Elizabeth go next. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Rosen, for that presentation. I am going to switch over to Dr. Elizabeth Hilborn for her presentation. And then I have seen a couple questions come in so far. Uh, please continue to type questions into the question box function. And then after Dr. Hilborn completes her presentation, we will switch over to some questions and discussion. All right, your slide is up and you are good to go. Great. Can everybody hear me? We hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, and thank you for the opportunity to talk today about the health effects of harmful algal blooms and algal toxins. And I'm really going to focus on freshwater cyanobacteria in this talk and focus on the human health effects touching on animal effects. Here's my agency disclaimer. So after I've spoken, I've had people reach out and say, let's just get rid of these things. These cyanobacteria are really bad news. They're hurting us. But I want to remind everybody that we wouldn't be here without cyanobacteria or something that took their niche because they are very ancient organisms. They helped establish our oxygen atmosphere over 3 billion years ago. And even today, they provide essential ecosystem services on land and in aquatic systems. The problem, of course, is some produce potent toxins as secondary metabolites, and these can poison animals. And um, Barry didn't mention marine stromatolites in his talk, but cyanobacteria involved in the formation of some of these oldest fossils on Earth. They're um, accretions or concretions. I'm not a geologist, but they are um, part of the stromatolite along with sediment layers. Cyanobacteria are globally abundant. And I would like you to look at the three photographs I have on the right. The top picture is an old growth forest where cyanobacteria cooperate with mosses on these ancient trees, fix nitrogen, and help to keep the trees healthy and fertile in this system. The second picture is a desert. Cyanobacteria help to form the crusts on the desert soil that not only keep the soil in place and prevent wind erosion, but are involved in nutrient cycling in that ecosystem. And then the third picture down is an aquatic bloom that we're all familiar with. And this is what I'm going to focus on today is cyanobacteria in aquatic systems. And blooms such as we see in the bottom right are certainly favored by stable eutrophic waters. By stable, I mean low wind, low mixing, they like a stable, warm environment. These are planktonic blooms, but also I'd like to touch upon benthic accumulations of cyanobacteria today. This is an emerging area in the United States getting a lot more attention. Really a lot of the um, groundbreaking work was done in New Zealand by Susie Wood, where cyanobacteria benthic accumulations have been associated with multiple dog deaths 
these accumulations can produce toxins just like the planktonic blooms. Now, warm water, uh, Dr. Rosen showed that warm waters favor cyanobacteria growth. And now we also have some evidence that microcystin production can be increased at higher temperatures. So our warming waters are really a problem for us trying to recreate in these impacted waters. And of course, cyanobacteria can be nutrient limited as Dr. Rosen touched upon. Cyanobacteria are a potential health threat to people and animals. And we've, we tend to focus on cyanobacteria toxins because when you take the toxins and dose uh, animal models, rodents, you can see these very um, specific effects of the toxin. So anatoxin A, a neurotoxic alkaloid, it mimics the effect of acetylcholine so at lower doses, you can get snotting, salivation, at higher doses, diarrhea, vomiting, convulsions to death. And it is known before it was characterized and named, it was called the very fast death factor because you take a, a preparation from impacted water, inject it into the belly of a mouse and the mouse is dead very quickly. But we still see this very fast death effect. Anatoxin A has been associated with dog deaths. I mentioned New Zealand, but also North America. And it's very dramatic because the typical scenario of people will be out recreating with their dogs, playing in the water, the dog comes out after a fun day, and is dead before it gets to the car. So these type of incidents have increasingly uh, been picked up by news media. Solyndra spermopsin is a general poison. It affects multiple tissues. It inhibits protein synthesis. And after a single dose, there are increased effects over time because we produce toxic metabolites that are more toxic than the parent compound. Microcystins are liver toxins. They are potent protein phosphatase inhibitors. And although the target organ is the liver, they can have knock-on effects in multiple organ systems, uh, the kidney, uh, the immunological system. So a high dose microcystin exposure has been seen with wildlife and livestock that drink heavily contaminated water. Um, a, a few cases of human illness where people were exposed intravenously to these toxins. And in these high dose exposures, you can see severe liver damage because the microcystins break down the liver cells as they break apart. Liver is a very vascular organ, starts bleeding, and you can actually see hemorrhagic shock and death within hours to days. At lower doses, there are more subtle effects such as elevated liver enzymes. When the liver cell becomes damaged, it releases enzymes that are commonly detected when you go to get a chemistry panel at the doctor, they may check your liver enzymes. And that's what they're looking for is cellular damage or damage to the biliary system. Saxitoxins are neurotoxic alkaloids. They're sodium channel blockers. You may know them as agents of paralytic shellfish poisoning. So these are best characterized as marine toxins, but we see them in freshwater systems as well. And their effects can be anywhere from tingling fingertips, um, temperature inversion. If you put something cold to your skin, it feels hot, visual changes, all the way to high dose, you get respiratory paralysis. So I want to make the point that the cyanobacteria communities that we see are not any one of those toxins. A toxic cyanobacteria bloom is not one of those things. In the real world, we tend to get mixtures, mixtures of toxins potentially, certainly mixtures of phytoplankton mixtures of microorganisms. Dr. Rosen was showing the mucilage around cyanobacteria. These 
create lovely biofilms that other microorganisms welcome as great places to live. So these are other bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, and some of these can be pathogenic. But what is clear is that once cyanobacteria occurs in a system, it can reoccur. So, and continued cyanobacteria dominance can change the overall composition of aquatic communities, change the whole food web. Now, US EPA, our Office of Water, has released recreational water guidelines, microsystems at in general at eight micrograms per liter and cylindrous permopsins in 15 micrograms per liter. The other toxins, there was not enough science to release guidelines at this time. And I want you to note that these guidelines are the first guidelines released and that every year that goes by, we learn more. So these concentrations may change over time as we have more science. And Dr. Rosen shows that not all blooms are toxic and you cannot tell by looking at them. So we do know that if the bloom is toxic, the highest risk materials in that bloom are the dense scums. Now, scums that are on the surface and get blown onto a recreational beach where people come in contact with this accumulated material. Once it dries, it has a strong odor and apparently taste. Dogs are attracted to the dried material, potentially children. So if you're dealing with a toxic bloom and have these scums on your beach, they need to be removed or dealt with because these would be the highest risk material. Now, I want to mention that health effects have been reported after exposure to blooms without concurrent toxin detection because the detection is not really concurrent. Let me just walk you through a typical scenario. People recreate the beach, that evening, they're not feeling well, maybe they're throwing up, maybe they have a rash. They go to the doctor the next day. If the stars align, the physician may consider that exposure to the waters associated with their illness. And if the stars are aligned even further, a harmful algal bloom may be implicated. Then that detection has to get out if just the doctor and the patient know it, it really does, nothing happens, but public health has to get involved, water managers have to get involved, environmental health, somebody has to go out and evaluate that water or communicate with the people who have been evaluating the water, what's in the water. Rarely do we have exposure and toxin evaluation coupled in time. And we know that cyanobacteria are highly variable temporally and spatially. So what that person encountered when they became ill is gone within hours. And we know that cyanobacteria can produce potentially hundreds of bioactive compounds. They are not well characterized, but they are little machines for producing bioactive compounds. So I mentioned Susie Wood in New Zealand, and here's a recent review paper she published. And it just shows benthic freshwater cyanobacteria and the toxins that they produce that we know about so far. So in North America, in the United States, anatoxins, saxatoxins, and microcystins have been detected and associated with these benthic accumulations. So it's important to realize that depending on your system, cyanobacteria toxins can be present without apparent blooms. And I show this dog because dogs are really sentinels for this phenomenon. Here are some pictures of benthic cyanobacteria accumulations. And on the lower right, you see this dachshund drinking from a nice, clear water column. But on the bottom, there's a green accumulation. 
So this is a typical scenario for dog poisonings. Owners will frequently say, but the water looked clear. So what is this dog being exposed to? Well, it depends. Is that dog lapping up bloom material? That would certainly be a higher exposure. Dr. Rosen showed that blooms in general, the cell has to be disrupted for the toxin to get into the water column. But we're always seeing breakdown of these accumulations. So there's a small amount of toxin being secreted by even apparently healthy looking accumulations. It just depends. You have to measure it to know what's there. But these incidents, when they occur, are very dramatic. I don't know how many of you out there are pet owners, but many people consider their dogs, their household pets, as part of the family. This photograph is from a young couple who are out recreating with their beloved household pet at a lake in Rochester, New York. And they spent hours at the beach and the dog dropped dead, convulsed, um, convulsed and dropped dead before they reached their car to go home. This photograph was used in a West Coast newspaper, the Sacramento Bee, to warn of California dog deaths in Napa. So this is a recurring incident. We just had, um, I believe it was last week or the leak before dog deaths in Texas. So this type of thing tends to make the media because people are very vocal about losing their animals. Now I'm gonna go into some of the peer reviewed literature in 2015, Trevino Garrison published a report about a very active bloom season in Kansas during 2011. They were evaluating multiple lakes after this bloom season started, but the main lake was Milford Lake. It's a large recreational venue, and the it was a microcystis-dominated system where microcystins were detected. Early in the season, as early as June, there started getting reported human illness from exposure to the lake. And seven of these cases were confirmed, meaning that the healthcare provider said, yep, they're probably associated with that harmful algal bloom. It's in a, a kind of a weight of evidence, professional opinion type of connection. There was a range of health effects. Rash, meaning redness of the skin, ulceration, gastrointestinal effects are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, upper respiratory effects, snotting, coughing, wheezing, fever, joint pain, and pneumonia, a lower respiratory effect. Seven dogs were also impacted and in this year, the dog effects came after the humans. So later in the year, August to September, there were six confirmed cases of illness and five deaths. So I'd like to go back in time a little bit. Um, in 1989, there was an interesting outbreak report from the United Kingdom. Soldiers were out canoe training. These are young, healthy men rolling their canoes. Some capsized their canoes in a microcystis dominated bloom. Again, this was determined after the illnesses, but that's what believed what they were exposed to. They developed acute nausea, vomiting, fever. Two were hospitalized and found to have the elevated liver enzyme showing some sort of liver damage. And they developed pneumonia, these two men. And at the time, everybody was like, why pneumonia? None of those toxins would cause pneumonia. What is this? Oh, they probably inhaled bloom material. They gasped as they went underwater because it's a common phenomenon. If you inhale a foreign substance into your lungs, you can get an aspiration pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia after um, that phenomenon. So that was the assumption. 
but in 2007, a case report came out of Argentina. A young man who was out jet skiing was immersed. He got off of his jet ski, immersed in a heavy microcystis bloom for hours. Again, this bloom was detected after the human health event. He had acute gastroenteritis. He became so ill, he visited healthcare system and was hospitalized. He had severe respiratory illness that required intensive care. He had to go on a ventilator. He had acute respiratory distress syndrome and he had liver enzymes, elevated liver enzymes for many days. So I have been collaborating with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Their national outbreak reporting system is a system that detects different kinds of illness events using public health surveillance. And they have different modules. They look for foodborne disease, different kinds of waterborne disease, meaning drinking water associated illness, recreational water associated illness, and report out every couple of years for the waterborne disease. During the 2009 to 10 cycle, there was a real difference. We had 11 algal bloom associated reports from New York, Ohio, and Washington, three states. All of these outbreaks occurred at public or private lakes, and all of them occurred during the summer months. 61 people became ill. There were no known deaths. The majority were female and young or children, and the majority sought health care of some sort. And the asterisk is there because they could have had more than one type. They visited their doctor and then were hospitalized. So that could be an overcount. These algal bloom associated outbreaks were poorly characterized, meaning to be included in this category, they were just stated as being algal bloom associated. There wasn't phycology on all of them. There wasn't toxin assessment on all of them. And the median duration of an outbreak ranged up to 44 days, meaning after the first person became ill, there continued to be people exposed and becoming ill for up to 44 days. So the, the nature of the risk wasn't well appreciated. This is really interesting, I thought, in that the onset of illness after exposure was generally rapid. The median onset was less than a day. And that's unusual with any sort of kind of um, waterborne disease exposure. So that's, that's something to, um, to peg and notice. But in general, algal bloom associated outbreaks were uncommonly reported to the NORS system prior to this reporting cycle. There are only three reported before this. I summarized the health effects to give you an idea of what was seen among these illnesses. Skin effects and gastrointestinal effects were equally likely followed by respiratory effects, upper or lower, and nonspecific effects. And that includes fever, loss of appetite, not feeling well, then ear effects, nervous system effects, and these included tingling in the extremities, visual changes, not being able to walk straight, cognitive changes like confusion or inability to problem solve, and then there were muscle, joint, bone, and eye effects. The most commonly detected toxins were microcystins, and this is back in 0910, so the microcystin ELISA was the most commonly used tool. After that, anatoxin A and saxitoxin cylindrus permopsin. I included this table from that report just to show you out of 11 outbreaks, and in the column one, that's the outbreak number. Um, if you want to go back and look at the report, it's publicly available. Only eight of these outbreaks were to toxins even, um, did people even attempt to detect toxins in the water body? And you can see that all eight people used the most common tool. 
in the uh, columns under cylindrospermopsin and microcystins, I just put in the uh, EPA guideline value there for your reference. But I'd like you to notice um, the dashes mean the toxin was not assessed, ND is non-detect. So it was evaluated, not detected. I'd like you to notice that there are mixtures of toxins and it's common for mixtures of toxins. Um, can you see my pointer? And yes, we got your pointer. Okay, great. So in outbreak number six and outbreak number eight, there was severe neurologic illness. And you can see um, relatively low toxin levels, although here's a low level of a neurotoxin. In eight, well, you'd be a lot more concerned with toxin concentrations like that. But we're not seeing a good match between toxin concentrations that were measured with when, excuse me, within one day of the outbreak period and actual reported health effects. And notably, the top row here is outbreak number six, the bottom row outbreak eight. There were animal illnesses and deaths before the human illnesses. In outbreak six, there was a fish kill and dog deaths. Outbreak eight, a heron illness and dog deaths at the site. Each outbreak refers to a single uh, recreational water body. So I worked with Dr. Val Beasley from the University of Pennsylvania, and we worked together to evaluate and review reports from around the world, freshwater cyanobacteria. Here, these animal illnesses and deaths occurred before the human illnesses. Could they have been used to close those venues and prevent human illness? And we looked at this in a One Health framework. And One Health is a thought paradigm that includes animal health, human health, and the environment. And it's basically a way to think about these wicked problems like cyanobacteria, multidisciplinary problems in an integrated manner. So this is a figure from our report that just shows the importance of, it's kind of an idealized communication. It shows the importance of talking to people outside your field. So if you work in water management, someone else works in human health, someone works in public health, another's a game warden, another's a wildlife biologist. By talking among these disciplines, getting phycologists involved, microbiologists, it can really help to characterize and understand these events. And we found that there were some instances where animal illnesses and deaths were used as sentinel events to prevent later human health um, effects, adverse human health effects. And these occurred primarily in smaller communities where there were few professionals in any one field. So all the professionals tended to talk with each other. Like the local veterinarian would sit down with the game warden and have breakfast, you know, once a week at the local restaurant. It was in the very large cities where people tend to be siloed into their specific disciplines that there was less communication among professionals. And we found that the most useful sentinel events that were associated with human health risk were the livestock events dog deaths and fish kills. So this is the most recent report out of CDC's National Outbreak Reporting System. After that 2009 to 10 cycle, they actually created a new module just for harmful algal blooms. And they call it the One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System because they collect reports of animal illnesses, reports of human illnesses, and the environmental phenomenon of the bloom itself. 
and the module collects information about both freshwater and marine blooms. And in the system started in mid 2016 and has been reported out now through the end of 2018. And during this time, 18 states reported over 400 blooms and 90% of these were in freshwater. The majority of human exposures occurred at public outdoor areas, meaning they were not at somebody's private pond where they were swimming. There were 389 illnesses where we know gender and age, about half were female, 40% were children. And notably, almost 200 illnesses were associated with a single bloom event. So it was a big outbreak. Now the order of the most commonly to least commonly reported effects here is different than the 2009 to 10 report. Gastrointestinal effects in the same rank order, but nonspecific effects are next. Then skin, nervous systems very last, and I don't see respiratory at all. So the the palette of effects reported with this greater number of blooms is different than the earlier summary. The most commonly reported toxins, microcystins, again, this could be a um, artifact of the tool used to detect it, or it could be a uh, true most commonly reported toxins, followed by anatoxin A, saxatoxins, and nodularin was detected in some brackish systems. So we're facing real challenges for HAB ascertainment. We all have limited resources. HABs are not always apparent. They can move in the water column. There's variable occurrence, concentration, when the wind changes, and duration of blooms. The weather can change and break up a bloom. There are real challenges for health effect attribution because there's a lack of provider awareness. If I'm out spending the day at the lake with my toddler, that evening he develops fever, vomiting, diarrhea, I bring him to the doctor the next day, that physician isn't going to think of harmful algal blooms. That's not the most common cause of fever and gastroenteritis in toddlers. And these are nonspecific health effects. So unless everybody is getting their blood drawn to look for potential liver enzyme elevations that might be associated with microcystins, there's, these are just fever, coughing, they could be associated with many different types of pathogens. There are no diagnostic tests to confirm that the illness is associated with a harmful algal bloom. At this point in time, we're at the stage of if we have an astute provider, they can collect biological samples like blood and urine and send them to specialty laboratories or to academic labs that are doing this type of research. But if they just collect samples and send them to the hospital laboratory, they will not look for cyanobacteria toxins. And the biggest challenge is people are exposed to mixtures. So not only cyanobacteria, but potentially pathogens as well in that um, impacted water. So awareness still is low, but it appears to be increasing. Animal illnesses and deaths can inform human health risk. Recreational venues have been the most common site of exposure because people are exposed to raw blooms. Most drinking water, unless somebody has a pipe into a recreational lake and is using it in their lake cottage, most drinking water is treated or groundwater is protected from deep groundwater from cyanobacteria. But at a recreational venue, people are in contact with water. They, especially children, may ingest water while they're recreating. And there are water aerosols, especially doing things like jet skiing or motor boating. We're seeing multiple nonspecific health effects are very poorly characterized. One 
clue, diagnostic clue, is that onset of illness may be rapid, more rapid than most pathogens. And that if you're going with a group and children may be more likely to become ill. But the important point is these cyanobacteria communities are the ambient exposures. So we're exposed to mixtures of phytoplankton and zooplankton, mixtures of microbes and mixtures of toxins. And that's why this is so unsatisfying and difficult is because a harmful algal bloom associated illness is not just one thing. So thank you for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Hilborn, for your presentation. I would also like to thank Dr. Ken Wagner for organizing this webinar and for identifying the presenters to share their presentations both in this session as well as in the upcoming webinar that's gonna take place in uh, the end, at the end of May. So we are going to move into our question phase uh, of the of the session right now before we do that i just want to mention uh, as a group uh, neck noms and the participants we recognize that cyanobacteria are increasing in frequency and severity and the talks included in both this session and the next session are data driven and while there is theory involved, uh, these are about what these these webinars are about what we really know, what we don't know, what we can learn, and what actions can be taken. So we are not preaching scare tactics, even though some of these things sound uh, pretty scary. But we are focused on scientific facts around data and proper and useful notifications about blooms when they do occur. Having the most complete understanding of possible uh, blooms of, and the organisms in their, enco their ecology, the factors that influence abundance and the options for control are essential. And that's what we're trying to convey between these two webinars. Uh, so uh, with that, we do have a number of questions that have come up in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna start and both uh, Dr. Rosen and Dr. Hilborn, feel free to, to chime in uh, on, on these as I go through them. The first question is from, the first couple of questions are from Dr. Ken Wagner. Um, and he states, the, the first published peer reviewed paper on the detection of anatoxin in the air by a lake was just published in Lake and Reservoir Management. Is, it looking more like a real route of exposure? And do you, either of you have any comment on this aerosolization of toxins? This is Elizabeth. I can comment that this is an area of intense interest and research activity right now. I have some anecdotal comments I can add and I'm sure Dr. Rosen has more, but for the last 20 years, we've been getting reports from lake managers that are out sampling in boats on blooms and come back to shore and their eyes are tearing, their noses are running, they're describing upper respiratory illness and they haven't had water contact. Dr. Lori Baker at the CDC has done some prospective work of recreators and detected microcystins from nasal swabs, and this has been confirmed in other studies. So it's looking likely that there is aerosolization of cyanobacteria, and that would make sense because we see aerosolization in marine systems. You have minerals and uh, marine organisms in the air near shore. Um, in red tides, the toxin can have effects on respiratory health for miles inland. There's less known about cyanobacteria, but there's a lot of people looking. I'll stop there. Barry, do you have anything to add?
Okay, uh, we'll move on to the, the next question. This is also from Dr. Ken Wagner. Barry touched on exposure and dose as key factors in toxic reactions. Do we have any idea of the real risk of swimming or boating on a lake dominated by potentially toxic cyanobacteria? Uh, is the occasional contact all that big of a threat? And I think Dr. Hilborn, you did cover that in your presentation, but would either of you like to add any additional details? Okay, I'm finally unmuted. So you can hear me now? Yes, Barry, we have yes. you. So I'm gonna go back to the aerosolization because I actually have a very detailed study going on where I have created an aerosolization chamber where I can regulate the amount of flow. I have cultures, individual species growing that make toxins. And I'm gonna be looking at all the different factors are going to simulate a, a bloom dying off, how much toxin is released, simulate them coming into contact with salt water. And we're going to know how many cells, we're going to know the amount of toxin in the cells and in the water, and we're going to capture the toxins coming out in an artificial lung, which has different sizes of, of capture. So you have bigger particles and smaller ones. And we'll have a better feel for um, the whole aerosolization question and the concentrations that might be coming out. The study that was from Nantucket, um, very interesting. It was a, a, a windy wind event, and there was a, an anatoxin A producer, the locus formum, in, in that water body. And is that common? I don't know. That was a, it was a one time, fairly large wind event. But as soon as we're done perfecting the laboratory methods, we are gonna start bloom chasing and try to figure some of that out as well. So stay tuned, give me a couple of years and I might have some, some good answers. Okay, thank you for that. Our next question is from Ronald Entringer and he asks, is microcystin production favored by form of nitrogen, ammonia or nitrate? Yes, it, it does prefer um, urea as one thing, and it does like ammonia. Those are its two superfoods. Um, it will use nit nitrate, but a little less readily. But those are both important components of microcystin, all the, all the nitrogen sources. Okay, the next question is from Dr. Ken Wagner. So if toxic cyanobacteria are always dying and releasing toxins, is there any logic to a rule prohibiting algicide treatment above some cell count threshold? For example, in Massachusetts, one cannot treat a lake with algicides if there are greater than 70,000 cells per milliliter, and one can see how liberating all that toxin at once might be bad. But if it's, a, if it's going to get released eventually anyways, is there a trade-off? And I know this is a really common question among state agency managers and others. So uh, welcoming your thoughts on this. Well, you know, I always talk about the kill zone. So if you kill cyanobacteria and it's, it's not the entire lake, then you're releasing their nutrients to their fellow, that are fellow organisms that are outside the kill zone. And are you then stimulating them? The other thing is, is the breakdown of the toxins. We know that there are many bacteria, there's a lot of studies out there, different bacteria that break down the toxins. Getting a big slug into a water body, if people are recreating it, you, you are creating that, that exposure. But I don't know what's better. It's better if you can treat it early, but a lot of times you may not know early to be able to treat it. So good question. Seems like we should drink a beer to discuss it. <laughs> This is Elizabeth. I just want to point out that releasing a large concentration of toxin at once, it's not just people who can be exposed, it's the aquatic life um, in the, the lake. So it's, it's a complicated question and a complicated answer, and there may not be a complete answer at this point. Okay, thank you for that. Our next question is from Thomas Trainer, and he asks, most commonly detected toxins, isn't it the case that these are the only ones we typically test for, so many others may also be present? Um, Absolutely. 
Yeah, there's other toxins, but for example, if you're doing LCMS MS, you don't get the full complement of all the microsystems out there. So it, even though it's a very precise method, you know, ELISA is better because you're picking up 85% of the kinds of microsystems. We don't know the mode of action and probably never will of each of the different forms of microsystems. So it gets very complicated. But I always tell people, don't just measure microcystin. Um, at least measure the other ones, like selenosomopsin, anatoxin. And I'd say start looking at saxitoxin because it's so potent. So they're all, they all can be done with an ELISA or ELISA-style kit. And I would say, personally, I always tell people, look a little deeper. And I think, Elizabeth, what do you think? My current understanding is that there are at least dozens of potentially potent bioactive compounds associated with blooms that are poorly characterized. So a dense cyanobacteria bloom, even if there are not um, detectable toxins in the big four, the big five, may still be associated with health effects. Dr. Rosen mentioned that these are gram negative organisms and they can produce endotoxins. And we know that high concentrations endotoxins are associated with respiratory irritation on their own. And that may be what we're seeing with some of these respiratory effects. We just don't know. Made me cough. Okay, uh, the next question is from Victoria Hall, and this is one that I think a lot of us hear often. Uh, I recently moved to a private lake. I noticed dead fish in May, June timeframe last year. Locals said it was the pollen. We did have a detected bloom in October. Could the fish kill have been related to the bloom? I expect the pollen is less likely the reason. What are your thoughts? And before you to answer that, and I'm sure you both have seen this, uh, in New Hampshire, we've definitely seen occurrences of cyanobacteria blooms mixed in with pollen and actually masked by pollen in the spring. So uh, welcoming your thoughts on the question and that statement. And in, in my opinion, almost all the blooms cause a problem, not from toxicity, but low dissolved oxygen because they're respiring day and night, but at night there's no oxygen production. So you get DO sags and the fish, if it's widespread, can't get away. And the, the toxicity of some of these toxins to fish is, is poorly known and they have very good liver function, at least from microsystem to break it down. So low DO and maybe pollen adds a, a, a biological oxygen demand to the water as well, I don't know. But um, yeah, it's it's the biomass itself that causes the problem, and they're they're sucking out the oxygen via respiration. Okay, thanks, Barry. Uh, the next question is from Bruce Durgan, and he asks if there is a recommended filter to put on water supply lines from a lake to filter out materials, potentially toxic materials. As if it was that simple. It, it's tough. So water treatment plants, we typically have to warn them, the higher the pressure on those filters, the more likely the cells that might have toxin in them are going to lice. So you have to do a gentle filtration to get them out. Um, and some use a sand filter. It, it's, it's a little tricky. Now, microcystin will break down in the presence, long enough presence of chlorination. But other compounds won't. I think cylindrospermopsin is highly resistant to chlorination. So again, once it gets in, it, it's more difficult. But there is no simple filter to get it out of the water prior to it coming into the, the drinking water plant that I know of. This is Elizabeth. Luckily, there is a huge body of knowledge about drinking water treatment so and treatment for specific toxins using ozonation, um, ultrafiltration, powdered activated carbon, but it is complex and there's no one size fits all answer. Thank you for those replies. 
Uh, the next question is from Craig Buffington, uh, and I think a lot of folks worry about this along lakes and ponds. Uh, can blueberries blooming near ponds contain toxins? And I think we can possibly extend that to gardens along shoreline edges or other other things that people are growing along shore that are consumables. We know that plants do take up in, in like microcystin. If it's present in the irrigation water, we know it can make its way into the leaves. Um, I don't know about the fruits, but I know it can make it into the leaves of lettuce and things like that. Elizabeth, you probably have a better feel for this. Well, I certainly agree with you that contaminated irrigation water has been shown to be associated with cyanobacteria toxins potentially in the irrigated plant. As far as aerosols just being next to a body of water, I don't think anyone's looked at that that I'm aware of. Okay, uh, the next question is also from Craig Buffington. My pond blooms each year, but it doesn't seem to affect beavers, fish, or other wildlife. Are beavers not affected by these toxins? Oh, anything with the liver should be affected uh, for hepatotoxins. But the question is really, are they consuming a dose that would where they would see a response? And maybe not. Maybe beavers don't drink water. I don't know. Just teasing. But. Okay. Our next question is from Wendy Gendron, and she asks, what would you recommend for a lay monitoring program to ensure the safety of pets and children? What can they do for monitoring or sampling? Come on, Elizabeth. I'm thinking because I have not designed this type of program and this is a really important question and I don't want to provide misinformation. The state, states do have, you know, there are ones, at least in Florida, that it's the Department of Health that posts, um, if there's a bloom that's spotted by the public or anybody, a different agency will actually come and collect a sample and they'll analyze it for toxins. And if there's a level of toxins, you know, like recreational usage, they'll get posted. But a lot of people will ignore it. It's 4th of July, the, the water's bright green with cyanobacteria. They're gonna go in it anyway. So how you protect the public is very complicated. It is, and I don't know how lay people, I mean, it, it does require resources to evaluate toxins, to evaluate if the green material in a water body is cyanobacteria. There's lots of green stuff in water and not all of it is. So it does require some resources to actually parse through these things, but I'm, I'm not comfortable just giving a, a quick answer to that question. From what I understand, it is very state specific and each state has their own type of monitoring program. Some of it is just at designated public beaches and the beach staff or the local town health officer tend to have jurisdiction there. In other states, there are statewide monitoring programs where that's picked up. Uh, the good thing is that all of you that are interested in that particular question, the next webinar that we're gonna have on this in May is also gonna cover monitoring. So we will make sure that we factor that into one of the presentations then uh, so that it can be covered. Uh, another question that just came in, uh, and I know that we're pretty close on time. There are just a couple of questions left, so I think we'll try to plow through if both of our presenters are good on time. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Craig Buffington asks, does it make sense to scoop up a bloom to remove the toxins and nutrients along with the bacteria? And I'm going to add an addition to that. What do you do with the stuff that you scoop out? They've been doing that in China. Um, Thai Lake is heavily impacted by blooms and they have programs where with a lot of labor, they've been collecting surface blooms and removing it from water but what do you do with it? If it's a toxic bloom, there are toxins in that material. Uh, some people have been applying it to farmland, but as we've said, um, 
with active toxin that has not been degraded, plants can take it up, um, although the, the material is nutrient rich. So um, again, a complicated question. Yeah, I, I don't think you're gonna have much success because what you're gonna do is just remove some, leaving all the nutrients behind that are probably already in the water for the next door neighbor who is gonna double and triple the next, the next day. Um, we used to tell farmers who had filamentous greens in their ponds that they could rake it out and get it out of, you know, out of the water, but this isn't the case for cyanobacteria. So, and you know, there's lots of things people are looking at, uh, biofuels from this material, and plastics, but again, it's 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 ninety nine point nine percent water, and it's not very useful for that kind of purpose. Okay, so the next question is from Beth Kelly, and we've got this one and one more. Uh, at Telly Lake, they keep people and dogs out of water until two weeks after, uh, two weeks of no algae. But other ponds here, people can swim in in a few days. When is it really safe to get back in the water? When toxicity isn't known? That's the question. It depends yeah. on the toxin. It depends on the bloom. Is it a benthic bloom? Is it a planktonic bloom? There are a lot of variables there. Yep, there's, no plenty, of, yep, there's plenty of toxins you can't see because it wasn't like that, like Elizabeth said, it, it's on the bottom. So there's no, without a toxicity measurement, and there are some handheld um, simple toxin tests, and I'm actually working on a handheld toxin gene test, but um, until those technologies are more widespread, it's a risk. And two weeks is just a, a ballpark on whether the waters are safe. Better to, if they really want to know, to invest in some of these simple um, immunological tests that you can, like, it's like a dipstick. Yeah, I agree. There's no substitute for testing the water and monitoring. Thank you for that. And speaking of testing and monitoring, we have uh, a comment from Doug Conroe, who is from New York. And he said, regarding sampling here at Lake Ch Chautauqua, we send samples to Greg Boyer and we participate in the New York State Department of uh, DEC and New York State FOLA CSLAP and the New York State HABS reporting system. So it sounds like there are multiple layers in New York State for uh, monitoring and reporting. So I, I would say we'll definitely try to address that in the monitoring talk uh, at uh, in the one that we have in May. Um, and one last question just popped in and that we'll call that good after this one. Uh, Carmen, uh, Carmen Harvier asks, if the pond is a keto with a depth of 62 feet, 42 feet would be benthic population or less. I'm not sure if that's a question or a statement. It's I it's the photo, the photic zone. So if you know if, if light isn't penetrating because you've got a bloom in there, and then the benthics are typically ones that are, are attached to the bottom. If they're attached to the sides down at the kettle. That's that's still benthic organisms. So not quite sure what the question is, but that's how we would think about it. If it's in the open water and moves around, then they're they're planktonic organisms. All right, that's all that I am seeing in the question box. I would like to thank both Dr. Barry Rosen and Dr. Elizabeth Hilborn for your great and informative presentations and fielding all of the questions that came in. Uh, and we hope you will all join us in May for the second part of this webinar series. With that, we're gonna conclude today's webinar and we thank you all for joining thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Send me samples. Bye. <laughs> thank you all.